LEGO games on handhelds. Sadly, you don't see much of them these days, mostly because the Switch exists. But for a long time, LEGO games would also release on whatever portable console that was relevant at the time. And due to the less powerful hardware, these versions would always be very different from their console counterparts. Like here's LEGO Indiana Jones 2, and here's LEGO Indiana Jones 2 on the DS. They're completely different games, just telling the same story and both having the typical stuff you do in a LEGO video game. They had basically rebuilt the game on a different engine that was fit for the hardware, and this always resulted in huge differences between the main versions and portable versions. So that's why today I'm going to be talking about the DS and PSP versions of LEGO Indiana Jones 2, LEGO Harry Potter Years 1-4, through 4, LEGO Star Wars 3, LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean, and LEGO Harry Potter Years 5-7. through 7. Starting things off with... LEGO Indiana Jones 2 is obviously the sequel to the first game, this time retelling the events of the fourth film and adding more levels for the movies they've already covered. It released on the 17th of November 2009 to pretty mediocre reviews. But what if I told you LEGO Indiana Jones 2 on the DS was better than the console version? The DS version was developed by TT Fusion, and this time around would also be ported over to PSP. I'm not sure if this is the exact reason they stopped porting the console version over to the PSP, but I found out there was originally a PlayStation 2 version planned, but was scrapped sometime during development. And a PlayStation 2 and PSP are kind of similar power-wise, so I'm assuming they saw no need on downgrading the console version to run on a PSP. That or the game could have just been too graphically intense for it. But after that, every LEGO game that was put onto the PSP or PS Vita would always be a port from the DS or 3DS, which really sucks because they're barely taking advantage of the hardware. Anyways, I played this game on the DS and I'm surprised to say, I really enjoyed it. The only reason I was surprised was because I haven't played a lot of these games since I was a kid. Yes, I played all the LEGO games to death as a kid, but I don't know if that means they'll hold up today or even be good. The game starts off with a cutscene made for the DS and PSP version of the game. This is seen nowhere in the console game, and it's really cool. But Indiana Jones is on a plane and apparently saw all of his past nemesis. A fight breaks out to try and take Indy's journal, which eventually leads to everyone falling out of the plane. The game starts off right where the cutscene ends, in the water with some plane debris. You find shore, climb up a tower, jump off the tower, and now you're in the main hub. What an introduction, I was not expecting that. I don't know if I've seen a LEGO game do something like that before. Something even stranger is that you can never access that area that you started in ever again. But yeah, this is the main hub. Just some island. It has all the typical stuff you expect, like a character creator and shop, but I don't see any doors leading to levels. All I see are two big doors. So I guess I should see what that's all about. And you'll never believe it. It's an open world that you can explore. As soon as I enter, Mac talks to me. Yes, this game has dialogue. So Lego Indiana Jones 2 on the DS and PSP had dialogue way before Lego Batman 2 did. But I have to help Mac down. Once I do, he gives me one of my journal pages. He also says this line, so you can relive those good times chasing after the crystal skull. So wait a second, you're telling me this game is taking place after the events of the fourth film? That's really weird. And that cutscene that played at the start of the game was apparently Indy and Marion going to their honeymoon. This game just keeps getting weirder and weirder. So in this island free roam, I will find more journal pages, which will let me recall my previous adventures. But after given the first journal page, I must select the journal icon. This gives me access to play the story mode which is just a retelling of the fourth film. No, they did not include any of the previous films like they did in the console. And this might be a hot take, but good. It's way too early to already focus on remaking those films. And plus, only focusing on the fourth film gives you more time to flesh it out. But I'll get back to the island free roam in a bit. The story is split into three acts, each act having four levels. But instead of having cutscenes before each level, you look through Indy's journal, which tells you the story through pictures and text as if you're reading what happened. This is really cool. I like how they're going all out with this journal concept. These are pretty wild. So many lame jokes, and at one point, Indy is questioning if Mutt is Marion's new boyfriend. The level levels in this game are really good, especially when you compare it to the console release. You see, one of the things I did not like about the console game was the levels. Almost all the levels in that game take place in one room and can be beaten in like 5 minutes. They aren't fun to replay and there's not even collectibles to find in each level. But in the DS version, yeah, all the levels in this game are really long and have lots to do in them. All the normal collectibles and whatnot are in here too, something completely missing from the console game. The levels in the DS version feel like what if the original LEGO Indiana Jones included the fourth film. It's jarring how different they are from the console release. For example, in the console version of the bar fight, it's its own level. 
and all you do in the level is fight people in a bar. It can be beat in two minutes, but on the DS, you do the bar fight and then have to free roam around the city trying to escape from gangsters. You even get to ride a motorcycle. Sure, the controls suck, but like, there's a lot more to do in this level. Some of my favorite examples are the car boat level and the ant level. In the car boat level on the console version, it's a car chase, something that you'll do so many times in the game. You just crash your car into others until the level ends. But in the DS version, you're doing platforming on moving vehicles and fighting enemies in your way or destroying other vehicles with a rocket launcher. And at the end of the level, you even get to have a duel. It's so much fun and a lot better than how the console release did it. Even if the DS can't even handle at times, it's still so impressive to see this. In the ant level, the console version is a joke. It's a huge ant monster that wasn't even in the movie. Once you defeat the monster, the level ends. That's it. But in the DS version, you start outside the ant cave and have to make your way through it with lots of puzzles and traps in your way. And at the end of the level, you have a boss fight that is actually accurate to the movie. The levels in this game feel like an adventure and they all have unique settings with lots of puzzles to solve and do a great job at retelling the events of the film. Sometimes I feel like some levels are a bit too long. Like before you go to the asylum level, it's dedicated to packing the plane and getting it ready. But Honestly, it isn't that big of an issue. The game introduces some new mechanics too, like you can now swing on ropes and there are some physics based platforming. Levels will now have vehicles in them that you can hop on and off of. And the new buddy system they use quite a lot is used to solve platforming and puzzle solving. Combat in this game is also tweaked a bit as well. You can now grab enemies and throw them, or if someone is beating up on your partner, you can grab them from behind and throw them. It's pretty fun pulling these off. Unfortunately, they nerfed Indy's whip from the first game. It no longer kills people in one hit after whipping them towards you. And on levels, you barely find weapons laying around like in the first game. They only will give you a weapon if it's needed to solve a puzzle. But other than the stuff I just mentioned, combat stays mostly the same from the first game, which is good. A lot of levels this time around don't rely on panels or panel minigames. To be honest, I don't even think I saw a single panel in the game. Instead, you have huge elaborate puzzles that can be pretty fun to solve. There's also only like one or two top down vehicle sections in the whole game. They still control awfully, but they're barely here. While playing through the levels, you'll occasionally get thrown at you a challenge, or sometimes you'll see a challenge button. If you press the challenge button, it'll ask you if you like to start a challenge, and these can range from pretty fun to boring. But I don't mind these at all. They were never too long and never took me out from what I was doing. A lot of these actually can be pretty fun too. I really like the bow one where you have to shoot boxes of TNT and pull back the crossbow using the touch screen. But yes, the levels are really good and a lot of fun. Not only better than the first LEGO Indiana Jones on DS, but also better than its console counterpart, which is insane to say. They have a lot to offer here and I have yet to go over the island free roam yet. I think it's about time we get back to it. So in this free roam, the main objective is to find Indy's journal pages. While exploring, you'll find most of Indy's past rivals and they'll give you a challenge or quest that'll reward you with a journal page. Each setting of the free roam is pretty unique and it's fun to explore. The challenges are okay though. Sometimes it can be super easy or just dumb. Well, I only say dumb because I had this one where you have to roll a ball using a touch screen and I'm playing with a mouse. It was really bad. Other than that one, they are all really harmless and the quests can be fun as well. Like trying to climb up a mountain, having a snowball fight, or having to sneak around to catch a monkey. But I was stuck on the riddle one for quite a while. It is really cool though, you have to travel around the whole map to find a solution. Overall, completing the whole island fear room doesn't take long at all. If you know what you're doing and have the right characters, it can be done in 45 minutes. But that doesn't make it any less cool. I really enjoyed it. Also, once you find all the journal pages, you get another cutscene exclusive to this version. It's basically the ending to the game. Indiana Jones and Marianne are able to make it to their honeymoon. It's a cute little cutscene and even has stormtroopers in it. If I did have some complaints about this game, it would be the music and what the journal pages unlock. For one, this game only has two songs in the whole entire thing. It gets really annoying. It's also confusing considering LEGO Indiana Jones 1 on DS had a pretty big soundtrack, but the journal pages, like I said at the beginning, will help you recall adventures you've had in the past. What they mean by this is they'll just give you some mini games themed around the films. You get four for each film and completing them is required for 100%. They have some good ones like the boulder chase scene from the first film, the one where you get to be an alien and throw people into a spaceship, and the whole racing mode that they for some reason have, but most of these just aren't fun. A lot of them are just platforming sections, and after a while they all blend in with each other. The one that annoyed me the most is the one where you have to be short round and go through a super long platforming challenge, and if you don't have the right amount of studs at the end, you fail and will have to replay the whole entire thing. Which was extremely annoying, but I don't have a lot to say about these to be honest. There is one more mode, it's called Build Your Own Adventure, but don't get your hopes up. You don't get to create your own level, which I could imagine would be really cool using the touch screen. Instead, you just choose from mini games and play four of them in a certain order. It's kind of weird, like, 
if you go on the journal, you can play the mini game from there. But you can also go back to the main hub and play four mini games in any order you want there. So it just kind of seems a bit redundant. It's pretty dumb. Like, why is it even here in the first place? But yeah, if you ignore the music and the bad mini games, because at the end of the day, they're just mini games, this game is extremely underrated and great. Although I do remember never getting far at all in the free room as a kid. I can reassure you, I do have good memories playing this game. I do think how this game handled its levels was a lot better than the console version. But even on top of that, the game has a lot of its own charm and style that just made me love it a lot more. I really like this game, and honestly, if you're sad of how LEGO Indiana Jones 2 turned out on the console, I would give this one a shot. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Two more cool things before I talk about the next game. Um, this game had multi-cartridge multiplayer. Still, this is extremely cool to me. You can even go through the free roam with someone else and do all the challenges together. Yes, even the really impressive racing one. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the PSP port looks like it has new textures and it looks so much better than the DS one, which I kind of wish I played it that way now. But yeah, that's all I have to say really, and I'm glad TT Fusion is heading in a good direction. But now time to start the next game. Lego Harry Potter years 1 through 4 was TT's first attempt at making a Lego Harry Potter video game, and it's really good. I personally think 5 through 7 is a bit better just because 1 through 4 had a bit too many glitches for me and they expanded the free room, but unfortunately I'm not talking about the console version of these games. Of course, they made a portable version of Lego Harry Potter, and what if I told you it's probably the worst out of any of the Lego portable games I've ever played. Okay, well I wouldn't go that far, but... I don't like this game. For one, the whole game is controlled using the touchscreen on the Nintendo DS. So you already know how well it'll hold up. Because of that, I decided to play the PSP version. Yes, a game designed solely on using a touchscreen was very lazily slapped onto the PSP, and the controls sound as good as you think. The game starts right off at the Dursleys, and the first thing you'll notice is the top-down camera angle. They obviously had to make this change since the game was made using touchscreen in mind, but it does not make this game feel like a LEGO game. The way you progress through levels is by talking to people. Yes, another LEGO game with dialogue. Once you talk to someone, they'll give you an objective or item that'll let you progress. On paper, this sounds like a cool and unique idea, but it's not really. Like, every level plays almost exactly the same. You're in an area and must go do the most boring objectives. The whole game is basically a fetch quest. Just go talk to someone, find an item, and the level ends. Or it'll be find all the ingredients for a potion, do a dumb mini game, and the level ends. Of course, not all levels are like this, but it's a good chunk of them. Hell, there are 44 levels in this game, and most of them can be beat in like two minutes. You'll see the same areas over and over again. Some other levels will have you sneaking around to get to another area. There'll be platforming, or you'll be learning a new spell and sometimes making potions. But a lot of these are executed really poorly. I think a lot of this has to do with the controls. So if you're playing this game on the DS, you would have to drag Harry around, kind of like the two Zelda games on DS. But in LEGO games, you do a lot of platforming and combat, and in LEGO Harry Potter, cast a lot of different spells. So how are you supposed to do that with the touch screen? Well, to cast a spell on an enemy or object, you tap on it. Same thing if you want to talk to an NPC. That doesn't sound too bad, but platforming. Oh my god, so when you get to an area or thing you need to jump on, you must tap on the blue arrows and it automatically does it for you. But hold on, it gets worse. So every time you want to cast a spell, you have to draw a certain pattern, or if you're on the PSP, press a button combination. This happens every single time you do a spell. And some spells play a stupid mini game after you finish tracing it. And that mini game will play every single time, and it'll be the same mini game with some little variations. You will play this over and over again. Which sure, on a touch screen, it might not be that bad maybe, but I played the PSP and the controls are really bad. You see, I only chose this version because I thought it would control better. But no, since you can't touch the screen, everything will be highlighted for you and you have to keep trying to scramble your character around to try and do one little thing. Like they have platforms that you'll need to jump on and then lift up. But since in a DS version, doing both those required tapping in a certain way, the PSP, you press the same button. This leads to so many times of me just trying to jump on a platform, but I keep lifting it up instead. Like, no, this didn't just happen a couple of times. My whole playthrough is like this. I'll just want to kill a Dementor, but nope, instead I'm casting a spell on an object I didn't even see. And not to mention, since you have to wait and do mini games after doing little things like jumping or casting spells, 
allows the game moves at a snail's pace. And to make it worse, animations will play after you do these spells. The game is also really buggy. Sometimes bosses will just start to ignore me, so I'll never be able to progress. Or I'll get stuck on a platform and keep spawning there, but never be able to jump down because you can't jump freely in this game. I don't understand on why 4 games in, now it's time to completely change the game to try and fit the touchscreen. LEGO games are so much fun because anyone can pick up and play them at any time and enjoy it. But here the game forces touch controls, or if you have a PSP you have to deal with the very lazily ported control scheme. Like what happened? LEGO games on portable were getting so good. Why did you design a game like this? I'm sorry, the game is just so boring and not engaging at all. You basically just listen to people talk for 5 minutes, do a not very fun objective or puzzle, and that's it. And on top of how long little things take to do, it just doesn't feel like a LEGO game. Of course they have a hub, but it's lifeless, you are the only character in it. It's just there for the shop, character creator, and so you can access the levels. I don't know, I went into this game with an open mind. I knew this game was like this. I played it on the DS as a kid, but I didn't get far in it. And honestly, I really can't enjoy this game even when I try. Maybe it's because I 100% completed it, which made me play this game a lot longer than most people, but I enjoy 100% completing these games most of the time. I just find this game really boring. If you enjoyed this game, honestly, please let me know why you enjoy it. I'm sorry if you really like this game, I just spent so much time shitting on it, but these games mean a lot to me. It's not a good game, it just felt like they wanted to have another game titled LEGO Harry Potter to put up on shelves. There's nothing wrong with taking a whole new approach for a game. Honestly, I love most of these portable LEGO games because that's what they do. But when you release so many games in one year, you just can't completely switch how you want the whole game to control and play. I feel like they were trying to be very ambitious with this release, but didn't have the time for it at all. Because even in the pause menu, you can look at items and they have descriptions for what you're doing. And levels will reuse the same areas and they're all connected in one way or another. It felt like this game was supposed to be an open world LEGO Harry Potter game where you can explore or look at objectives and collect items and solve puzzles. But that's just what I think. To be honest, if this game was like that, it would have been better, but I don't think I would have enjoyed it. The controls and casting spells are still a chore to do, and it's just a boring game overall. The PSP version would also still control poorly. This game doesn't feel like a LEGO game. And if it didn't have anything to do with LEGO Harry Potter, I never would have known its existence. I'm done talking about this game. This is by far my least favorite out of all the LEGO Portable games I've played. Yes, even lower than LEGO Star Wars 2 on DS. I think I'm mostly just mad I had to play it for 17 hours just to get this as my reward. Obviously this game doesn't have multiplayer, it's the first one to not actually include multiplayer which is kind of sad. I recommend staying away from this one. The game did release an iPad as well later down the line because of course it did. It kind of fits that market more to be honest. But it's now time for the next game. LEGO Star Wars 3 always felt like an odd title to me. Why not just call it LEGO Star Wars The Clone Wars? Anyways, LEGO Star Wars 3 is Traveler's Tales 4th LEGO Star Wars game. Kind of. This time being based around the new at the time Clone Wars animated series. To be honest, I have not played the console version of this game in quite some time, but I do have lots of memories playing it, and the same can be said about the portable version. Now this was the first game made for the Nintendo 3DS. It was also ported to PSP and the DS. I played this game on the PSP mostly because emulation is better on that console and it looks better than the 3DS version. Starting up the game, you can see we have a pretty big graphical upgrade. And I think this game is using a different engine from all the previous LEGO handheld games. Like just moving and fighting and a lot of animations feel and look a lot smoother now. But I'm not too sure. The hub world is almost identical to the one in the console release. At least the starting room is. You got the bar area that contains a shop and a few arcade machines, the character creator, and the mini kit viewer. The starting room, much like the console version, is where you start missions and play them. You also notice that you no longer have an AI player with you anymore, which kind of sucks. To be honest, it makes the game feel really lonely, and I already know it's going to mess up a lot of the puzzles. And unfortunately, because of this change, multiplayer is no longer an option. Levels in this version as well can only be played in a certain order. There isn't multiple branching stories like in the console version. But hey, how are the levels? Well, you won't be doing much out of the norm from any other LEGO game. Graphics wise, this is the best they have ever been. Locations now look and feel very distinct from one another. Every level is split up into acts, and can be decently long at times. 
This game goes for the same approach as LEGO Batman on the DS did. The levels are set in the same area as the console version, but what you do in them is completely different. To be honest, there isn't a lot of puzzles in these levels, and what you do in each level starts to feel the same after a while. You always just keep heading forward using the force on objects, fighting enemies that get in your way, or destroying stuff using your blaster. And while the settings might be different for these levels, a lot of the time, what you do in them is pretty much the same. Also, this game doesn't have the new battle mode like the console version, but they have spaceship battles, which seeing this on a PSP, not that impressive, but on a 3DS or DS, it is pretty impressive. It controls really well, surprisingly, and they're really fun. They also don't interfere with the flow of the game because they transition really well into other levels. Like I start off this level in a spaceship, then land on the enemy ship and the rest of the level takes place inside the enemy ship. It makes the levels feel massive and makes it great for variety. They also have top down sections where you're supposed to just keep moving and shooting. These can be fun but they fall into another issue I have with the game, the combat. While I like how smooth all the animations look for swinging your lightsaber and how you can move while fighting and it flows really nice together, it doesn't feel good to fight enemies. With a lightsaber, it feels fine but guns do not feel good and most characters with guns just can't fight an enemy. They can only shoot. Enemies will take a long time to defeat with a gun, and it really sucks because they added some cool new additions like strafing and being able to aim. Even if I never used the strafing and aiming doesn't feel all that great, I'm glad it's here. I think the main reasons that characters of guns can't fight is because, well, if you use a character that only has their fist, the fighting is very awkward. They do this stopping thing after every single hit, like it's a stutter. It feels really bad to use, and you will like slide forward with no animation. The enemies can also still attack you while you're punching them. I don't understand on why they changed the combat. It, it was a lot of fun to use in LEGO Batman, LEGO Indiana Jones, and all of those games, but why is it completely different here? I was mainly a Jedi anyways, but this problem also occurs with Jedis as well. You see, now that they can fight while moving, it kind of makes everyone else feel very weird that they can do it as well. I don't know, the whole combat just feels like a mess in this game. Jedis can also force push, but I didn't figure this out until really late in the game, and it's not useful anyways. It felt a lot better in the complete saga. You can also deflect bulls with perfectly timed button presses, which actually does feel kind of cool. But yeah, no, the combat is really bad and a huge step down. There's some new tasks that'll be thrown at you, like being able to cut through walls and force jump. But sitting through these animations for these actions really slowed the game down. Not to mention in the levels, there are tons of in-game cutscenes that'll play even on free play mode, and they are pretty annoying. It completely takes me out of the game and they happen like every five minutes. Everything will be over explained to you. Like after watching an in-game cutscene, it'll show you how to get through an obstacle, but it's not needed. I could have figured it out myself. Like that's where a lot of fun comes from in LEGO games. I know I'm complaining about this game a lot, but they did introduce some great quality of life features, like being able to save an exit on free play, or when you select an act on free play, it tells you how many collectibles are in that act. These were pretty nice changes and kept me from having to replay the whole level if I only needed to collect one more thing. Animations in this game also have a lot more life in them. When you defeat droids, they have unique animations for it, and it looks great when pulling off actions like fighting. Levels look amazing in this game, and each one of them having tons of different camera angles making them feel more dynamic. Getting red bricks is also easier because you were told what level they are on. This is also the first time they've actually implemented mini games in a good way. They're not overcomplicated and simple addictive time wasters, giving you a nice amount of money for completing high scores. There's a snowball fight one, which is weird because Indiana Jones 2 and Lego Harry Potter both had snowball fights. There's a baseball one, even though I was really bad at it, it's still pretty fun. These changes are pretty great. I just wish all the levels didn't feel the same. Doesn't help that the characters aren't really all that special either, and some of the characters having really weird designs like everyone from the original trilogy. They all have baby faces. This game has been interesting with the jump from the DS to the 3DS. There are a lot of cool new changes here, but also some stuff I just don't like. But hey, they did okay for their first game on the 3DS. This game does feel quite different from the console version, but yet yeah, it's also just kind of bland. While I liked playing through the story, these levels just aren't good enough to replay, which is my main gripe with this game. Levels all just have you move forward with the occasional thing in the way, and somehow I forgot to mention, panel mini games are back. But it's probably because they're not as bad here, only being two and barely relying on panels in the first place. Now before I move on to the next game, there are some strange things I want to mention. Does anyone remember Street Pass? Yes, this game had some Street Pass features exclusive to the 3DS. You could spend your Street Pass tokens in the shop and use it to buy characters exclusive to the 3DS. Which really annoyed me. Why is Boba Fett even an exclusive? I played the PSP version and did not want to replay the whole game on 3DS just to unlock these characters. So I didn't get to test them out, but I'm sure it's not that big of a deal. And the other thing I wanted to mention is 
the DS version for some reason has a whole new hub. Well, it's not new, it's just designed differently with certain things moved around. The PSP and 3DS version have the same hub, but at the end of the day, everything is there, just the layout is completely different for some reason. I have no clue why this is. I thought it was because the PSP and 3DS were more powerful systems, but I wouldn't make any sense because everything is still there, it's just all moved around. Oh well, I feel okay about this game. Some new good stuff, a lot more bad stuff, but that's what happens when moving over to a whole new console. I enjoyed my time with this version growing up, although as an adult, getting 200% was really boring. If you need another LEGO Star Wars game to play, I kind of recommend this one, but it's not that fun. Anyways, it's time for the next game. LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean was a great addition to TT's LEGO video game series. It felt like the perfect pick to have a LEGO game, and I have tons of memories playing the console version and handheld version. This was a game I got off my first 3DS growing up, and the first LEGO game I went out of my way to 100% complete. I haven't checked it out since then, and I'm really excited to see how well it holds up. I'm going to play the PSP version for the same reason I played LEGO Star Wars 3 on PSP, and yet again, this version was released on PSP, DS, and 3DS, with little differences between them except for the graphics. The game starts you right up on the first level, and the first thing I notice is how identical this is from the console version. The first level, you do the exact same thing as its console counterpart, down from locations and hell, even the exclusive mini kit locations. The graphics even look great, with characters even having great animations. This is crazy, and I can say the exact same thing for almost all the other levels in this game as well. You can even go underwater. There are four stories in this game, and each story has four levels. Unfortunately, one level from each story had to be cut from the console release, but it's not that bad, and with how insanely close the levels are to the console release, it's something I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm glad they were able to recreate the levels from the console version so well, but not everything is exactly the same. Like, some characters are a bit different that change how you traverse areas, like people with two swords can climb up walls, or Jack Sparrow only being able to use his compass in dedicated areas. But that's hardly an issue. If I had to say a complaint about these levels, it would be I wish they could stand out a little more on their own. Don't get me wrong, it's great how similar they are to the console version, but it doesn't give me a lot to talk about, and it just gives me that feeling that I should just be playing the console version. Like there isn't any real reason to go play LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean on the 3DS, because the levels are practically the same and you are plus missing a couple levels. It also won't have as big as a hub world. This isn't a bad version, but when going for this approach it gives me no reason at all to ever want to play it, and it starts to make things I don't like about this version stand out even more, like the combat. The combat all looks really nice and looks similar to the console version if you were comparing them, but it all just feels kind of flat. Like you just keep mashing the button, but there isn't any impact to your hit. It's like when you fight, you're watching an animation rather than controlling what you're doing. It's kind of hard to explain without playing it for yourself. I'll use this as an example. Okay, when you fight in LEGO Ninja Jones 2, and then compare it to here. In LEGO Indiana Jones, characters fight back and you can block it. You're also able to tap an enemy once, but here characters will just try to slash you once, and you can't even hit an enemy once. You must press the button four times and then it automatically just kills them. The same animation plays every time as well, which makes it feel boring and long, so I just was using my gun throughout the whole playthrough. Not to mention, characters without swords have the same issue as LEGO Star Wars 3 when it comes to combat. Also, every boss fight is now this new dueling mode, which is just a matter of pressing a certain button at the right time. It's not fun and keeps the game from having cool and original boss fights. It also gets really annoying when I have to do this five times in one level. This is also what they turned a 3DS exclusive Street Pass mode into, but hey, out of all the combat stuff they messed up, at least they finally perfected shooting and aiming. Now shooting is its own button from fighting, so you have full control over what you want to do. And aiming feels great, it's even used to solve some puzzles. I literally would only use guns during the whole playthrough, but other than those things I just mentioned and of course the game's lack of multiplayer, the game is the closest they've gotten to recreating the console game. While the hub isn't the same as the consoles, a lot of it's still here, like being able to go inside the bar or going to the deck to play some levels. But that doesn't save it from me not having much to say about this game. I did enjoy my time 100% completing it, but when it actually came down to writing this, I was finding it hard on things to say, or what I actually thought about the game. It's a good game and does a good job at being LEGO Pirates of the Caribbean on the go, but there isn't too many things I have to say about it. Like I won't remember anything about this game, and at least when it comes to LEGO Harry Potter on DS for example, I can remember how stupidly bad and ambitious that game was. But all I can say about this game was it did a good job at not being unique, and I hope TT Fusion going forward strives to be more unique. 
It's like they keep flip-flopping on if they want to be really ambitious or just try to remake the console game. And honestly, this is what kept me interested in these versions in the first place. Trust me, this journey is only going to get weirder and weirder. So I kind of recommend this game. Like, trust me, it's a good game, but if you've already played a console game before, just prepare to be disappointed. Also, something I completely forgot to mention, but this game uses cutscenes from the console version, except for in the last film. Almost all of them are in-game cutscenes, and it's really jarring. Like, why? The console version had cutscenes made for that film, so why not just use those like you've been doing throughout the whole game? I don't know, it doesn't matter. But now it's time for the final game in today's video. LEGO Harry Potter Years 5 through 7 is a sequel to the first LEGO Harry Potter game. My hype for this game was at an all-time high, and getting this game on Christmas is a memory I will never forget. I wouldn't be able to get my hands on the 3DS version until much later. Thankfully, this game does not take the same approach as Years 1 through 4 did for the portable version. This game feels just like the console version, having all the same spells and such and potion making. Also, the way characters look and idle animations remind me a lot of the console game, which really amazed me as a kid. But right at the start of the game, I already had have an issue. Lego Harry Potter for the console takes a pretty different approach on how the story is told. Having lots of levels but also having lots of story progression in the free roam with lots of events and classes you go through but you will never be able to play again. So when making this game for the portable market, of course they didn't include the free roam. So the main thing in this game is the levels. But the levels here are extremely short and missing a lot from what the levels had in 5 through 7 in the first place. And without all the extra story progression and events and classes you have in the free roam from the console game, the game feels like a mess and very weirdly paced. A lot of the time, levels will just be random short segments that don't go together. It also doesn't help that every single time you complete what you're supposed to do in the level, a blue map will appear. This blue map will just teleport you to the next part of the level. And it feels kind of odd because sometimes you'll be in the same area in that level. I don't know why they have to do this, because in other LEGO games, it kind of just all flows seamlessly. But here, it's like I'm moving between certain parts, but the parts are like two minutes to complete. A lot of these levels are just missing whole segments as well. Like, it could have shoved a lot of events from the free roam into levels. The Deathly Hallows Part 1 story is the one that was affected by this the most. It only has two levels in the whole thing. I'm always so frustrated about this because this game feels like the main console game just without the free roam. And I was having a lot of fun with the gameplay because it's exactly what you expect from the console. Even areas and the levels are exactly the same. Like, it's insane. It's all here and a lot of fun. I just wish there was more of it. Gameplay wise, this is definitely the best out of all the ones I've played today. All the characters have the same abilities and pretty much everything you do in the console game is experienced here. They're doing what is even here. It's a bit different, but it's also not fun like the console version. Anyways, I stormed through this game pretty fast. It was super short, and if they would have added more levels into the game and cut down on all the weird transitions, I would have really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong, not a bad game, there just isn't anything here. And again, I don't have too much to say about it either really. Not a whole lot stands out about this game other than how much it feels like the console version and how much the levels suck. The game's hub is also not that special either, just one part of Hogwarts where you have all the main things to expect, like a shop of course. The only new thing in the hub is the dueling club, which is just the dueling mode I mentioned earlier. Just now you can fight specific people and unlock more characters. But overall, this is a pretty boring release. Like I said, the game feels like the console version, but it's missing the free roam and the levels are an absolute joke in this game. So I really don't have anything to say about this release. Like if you want to play 5 through 7, please play the console version. You won't get any excitement from this portable one. I enjoyed this game a lot as a kid though and was extremely happy it wasn't like 1 through 4. It also has the same issue I had with Pies of the Caribbean, but worse. Not a lot stands out and much less content from its console counterpart. But yeah, it's a good game, just boring. It also released an iPad later down the line and honestly it suits that market more. But yeah, I don't have much else to say about this game. The games I have talked about today have been an interesting experience. While in my last video, talking about these portable LEGO games, everything was exciting and more experimental, but I feel like this era was mostly just okay. The games have gotten more similar to the console version, but it doesn't really bring me excitement to play them. It just makes me want to go play the console version. It sucks that after LEGO Harry Potter years 1-4, through 4, they stopped trying to experiment and are playing things extremely safe. But if you know the history of LEGO handheld games like I do, this is not going to last forever. In both a good and bad way. But hey. I just 100% complete 5 games, and still have 13 more to go. At least, I have 9 I can scratch off my list. I'm excited to continue this journey either way. I'm happy to finally be shedding some light onto these games that I played to death and anticipated as a kid. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for the third part in this series when it, it 
eventually comes out. 